I had muesli for breakfast. But can I thank Simon Stone, Director Simon Stone, for the first planking reference today here <laughs> at TED. You know, I am very happy to be speaking here today, and I'm sure everyone is, because it means the day is almost over. We're all a little bit elated, aren't we? We're all a little, a little bit exhausted at this stage. I mean, it's been a long day, let's face it. Some of the talks today could have been, you know, a little bit, possibly. But there have been so many good speakers today. But, but before I go on to them, I just want to congratulate all of you out there. Remember that you are a hand-picked audience. You went through a very complex process to get in here today, unless you knew Remo. <laughs> <clears throat> First, you had to become a TEDx Sydney community member. Now, we only wanted the best to attend, which is why the questions to qualify as a member was so hard, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, a lot of people complained about that, but we had to do it. And the thing about the TEDx Sydney community is that you're all go-getters. You're people who set goals and achieve them, except for this girl here. <laughs> no hurry, OK? Uh, <laughs> but look, all of you in the end, all of us, were chosen in the end because we're all inherently TED. As an example of how talented this audience is, it includes the producer of The King's Speech, Emile Sherman. Emile is out here somewhere. I think you saw him over there. Congratulations, Emile. Yeah. <laughs> and Emile, maybe if you achieve something next year, you can be up here on stage too, hey? <laughs> Before I go to the speeches, though, I just wanted to say how fantastic the music was today. It was quite amazing, ladies and gentlemen. Every musical act. <laughs> Although, and I, I've always been a massive fan of foreplay, I think it's time you started flying, guys, okay? <laughs> the pressure's on. Now I will briefly and incorrectly summarise the speakers we've seen here today. We started with uh, Brian Gainsley, the astronomer, a man who has done more work on dying stars than Joan Rivers' plastic surgeon has. <laughs> now, now, Brian... Brian took a big challenge. It was a big challenge. He wanted to make us realise just how insignificant we really are in the universe. And he did succeed. I mean, if you look at the Ted self of self uh, sense of self-importance before his speech and then after, he's really knocked us down there. <laughs> he also told us that dark matter and dark energy comprise 95% of all matter and energy in the universe. It also makes up 75% of the media as well. <clears throat> Actually, just a bit, of, a bit of housekeeping while we're here, ladies and gentlemen. I just want to actually use Brian's graphic because it was quite useful. As you see, he's established where we are right there. Uh, and just, just so you know, the after party's there, OK? So <laughs> just use that to make your way there afterwards. Then we had the, uh, David Chalmers, who is a philosopher, uh, director of the Centre for Consciousness, based in Canberra. Ironically, given it's not a place normally known for consciousness. But... <laughs> David discussed the extended mind, which can be summarised as, I phone, therefore I am. <laughs> he argued that our iPhones are now part of our mind. And this was a truly amazing experience, ladies and gentlemen. This is the first time in the history of mankind that somebody has actually exaggerated the capacity of an iPhone more than Steve Jobs. <laughs> yeah. But the, the realisation, though, that our minds are our phones is a fantastic one, ladies and gentlemen. And I, and I took him up on this idea because I actually did steal David's phone. And now I am a consciousness philosopher. Thank you. It's the, the highest honour I've ever had. We then had Genevieve Bell, a corporate anthropologist and one of the 50 most creative people in business, not including tax accountants, of course. She was actually the first Australian asked to be a thinker in residence in South Australia. Now that she's left, there are no fingers in residence in South Australia. <laughs> Genevieve asked us to embrace boredom, presumably thought of when in Adelaide. And I don't know if she really... <laughs> I'm not sure if she entirely gets Ted. Can you imagine if Genevieve ran Ted? <laughs> but in the end, I found Genevieve to be an absolute hypocrite, because she was actually extremely interesting. Thank God one of the speakers later was more faithful to her mantra. <clears throat> I didn't name anyone, could be me, <laughs> probably is. 
We then went on to our Josh Cook, our bird behaviourist. Now, a lot of things really fell into place for me during this speech. When he said that a parrot kept in captivity develops excessive screeching and aggressive biting, I finally really understood this parrot. Mango, though, was clearly the star of the show. Mango was quite amazing flying down here. And it was great, because what I quite liked about that is I discovered that birds are just like my children. You kind of have to shout at them and whistle at them to come to you, and in the end, you have to give them a biscuit. So... <laughs> we then had Richard Cotton, the geneticist, and really, I really liked gen the, uh, Richard Cotton. He has a humanitarian, egalitarian, equitable approach to spreading medicine. In America, he would be hated and called a communist, wouldn't he? <laughs> the only downside of his speech was that since he showed the diagram of Craig Venter's DNA, um, Craig Venter has now been denied health insurance. So that was a bit of a shame. <clears throat> and then Richard Gill. <clears throat> Richard Gill started by asking for the lights to be brought up on the audience so we could pretend that we were all in the same class. And, and it worked amazingly, because when the lights came up, everyone was upper middle class. <clears throat> Richard then showed us that we're the first audience ever who can't clap properly. <laughs> Something was again proved with Ben's drumming later on in the show. He then argued that we should teach children music. It was a great message, although he did somehow miss the important second step of that message, which is then to put your child on YouTube and wait for a recording contract with Usher. <laughs> and by the way, I still don't know what a crotchet or a minimum is. We then had Catherine Samaras, the endocrinologist. Uh, and look, look. Her speech had a lot of guts in it, you've got to say. As far as I could understand it, she suggested we become Orthodox Greeks and fast for 200 days a year. That idea is so crazy, it is bound to become a best-selling diet book. <laughs> we then had Grace Caskins, the historian. Her speech showed us the early letters of Margaret Catchpole, writing home to London and telling them about how great Australia is. And today, in Bondi, you can still see the frightening results of these letters. <laughs> as more and more palms flock to our shores. She also showed us something we've never seen before in Sydney. A, a livable Sydney there, uh, as you can see. <clears throat> and she told us about the amazing number of births in our convict colony. Quite a fascinating thing. Although, again, she left something out. What she didn't tell you is they were just doing it for the baby bonus to get plasma screens. <clears throat> we then had Vina. Sahajwala. Now, Veena was a scientist talking about sustainability and the environment. I have no understanding of what she said. I understood nothing at all. It was way too complex for me to understand at all. And when I explained this ignorance to somebody at lunchtime, it was fantastic, because I now have been offered a job as the climate, climate science writer at the Australian newspaper. <laughs> yeah. As far as I could understand, her whole thing was about a different way of getting rid of spare tyres, which is good news for these guys again. <laughs> we then had Saul Griffith, the inventor. He's fantastic. Great speech there. I mean, he's invented so many things over his time. Cheap eyeglasses, a machine that reproduces itself, his Wikipedia entry, and, <clears throat> and the only plane that has worse service than Jetstar, <laughs> but is still safer somehow. <laughs> And the problem, with, the problem with Saul as well is that he was so young when he did all this. I mean, have a look at this. Here is Saul in the time of his life when he had invented affordable glasses, but not affordable haircuts. <laughs> I must be, uh, to be fair to Saul, I'm just a little bit jealous because I also embarked on a process of making affordable glasses for the third world. Sadly, mine didn't take off so well. <laughs> we then had Josh and Daniel, Daniel Johns and Josh Wakeley. Josh and Daniel, they showed us that musical, musical collaboration is based on voicemail. <laughs> Which is why people with Vodafone aren't able to make music. <laughs> there were so many hacked voicemails in that presentation, I thought it was from News of the World. <laughs> but Josh, to be fair, left out an important part of collaboration. And, and I found it actually on somebody else's voicemail, uh, Paul Kelly, who's coming up today, when I, I, I've heard his. Hi, it's Paul Kelly here. You can leave a message after the tone. Look, if it's Josh, listen, uh, I've already told you, I, I really don't want to do the music for your movie, so why don't you ask Daniel Johns?
Rejection's the important part, ladies and gentlemen. And just while we're on this performance, this whole idea of performance, we also had Reeves, the, the, the performance poet, who's come all the way from, Boy, from New York. Could you be making fun of me and my man, Reeves? Sorry, what are you, you going to do about it, mate? Uh, fisting? Fisting, no, I might move on from that, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> <clears throat> we then had Drew Berry, the biomedical animator. This was quite extraordinary animation. I, I, was, I was quite blown away with it. And I, I don't want to be... His, his malaria video was absolutely chilling, wasn't it? And I, I don't want to be too much of a critic here or anything, but I'm just saying, I thought the character of the malaria... <laughs> Could have done with a buddy, maybe. Um, maybe you should talk to Pixar, you know, get a more, uh, just a more uplifting, life-affirming end, I thought. That's the only thing I'd say there. But it was great animation, nonetheless. We then had Joanna Featherstone, my good friend and poet. Although, and I don't want to be pedantic again here. I've said this to Joanna a few times. Not much of it rhymed, Joanna. <clears throat> And I, I, know, I know Oprah has retired, and I, I don't know if Joe is, is ready, quite ready to step into the breach there. She, she's made the first step. It's not quite there, though. Look under your seat. You get a poem, and you get a poem. You get a poem. No one got a car, unfortunately. <laughs> the, amazing, the thing I thought was brought everything together, though, today was when Joanna was describing pigeon poetry. You could just see Josh Cook sitting in the audience, suddenly realising why one day... 50 pigeons bought him poetry. <laughs> oh, that's what it was. <laughs> but all in all, ladies and gentlemen, it has been an amazing day with amazing speakers. And as we draw to a close, no doubt you are all feeling very good. We've all had that feeling of intellectual exploration, of discussing ideas. You have all had that exclusive TED experience. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>